the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always. A warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today in the church to pray and worship. We welcome also those of you who are joining us via the live stream. Very special welcome today to the Oblates of St. John Abbey who are here for their day of reflection. And I can't not say happy St. Patrick's Day to all of you. My sisters and brothers, to prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries, let us call to mind our sins. I confess. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. pray. By your help, we beseech you, Lord our God. May we walk eagerly in that same charity with which, out of love for the world, your son, your son handed himself over to death. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The days are coming, says the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors, the day I took them by the hand to lead them forth from the land of Egypt. For they broke my covenant, and I had to show myself their master, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will place my law within them and write it upon their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer will they have need to teach their relatives and their friends how to know the Lord. All from least to greatest shall know me, says the Lord for I will forgive their evil doing and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord.
and more from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. Against you, you alone, have I sinned, and what is evil in your sight I have done. Cast me away from your presence, nor deprive me of your Holy Spirit. Create a clean heart in me, O God. Give me again the joy of your help with the spirit of fervor. Sustain me, O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Create a clean heart in me, O oh God. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. In the days when Christ Jesus was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The Word of the Lord. Lord be with you. 
reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Some Greeks who had come to worship at the Passover feast came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there also will my servant be. The Father will honor whoever serves me. I am troubled now, yet what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? But it was for this purpose that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd there heard it and said it was thunder. But others said, an angel has spoken to him. The Gospel of the Lord. This gospel passage begins with a significant event, the arrival of some Greeks who wished to see Jesus. When I was a young boy, I always would hear these kinds of passages and think, you know, if I had only lived back in the day, and if I only got to hear Jesus and see Jesus, I would probably be a better Christian and a better disciple, and my faith would be so much stronger. And as I got old and reflected on the many people who did get to see Jesus and hear him, I realized I'd probably be in with the majority. The presence of the Greek worshipers at the Passover signifies a pivotal moment in the the ministry of Jesus. Jesus always said that he came to call the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But now we hear that the Greeks are coming to Jesus. And so this signifies that the mission of Jesus is beyond the lost sheep of the house of Israel and extends to the Gentile Gentile world as well. When Philip and Andrew go to Jesus and tell him that the Greeks want to see him, presumably, to speak with him, Jesus doesn't exactly answer the request. In fact, he doesn't answer it at all, except to say that his hour has come, the hour for the Son of Man to be glorified. This glorification, however, is not what the disciples probably expected and what the world in general would expect glorification to look like. It's not a triumphal entry into prestige and power and privilege. Rather, Jesus sets himself on a path of self-emptying, self-sacrificing love. In this truncated encounter with the Greek visitors, which parallels one we heard a couple of weeks ago when Peter, James, and John were with Jesus on Mount Tabor, Jesus seems to be looking beyond the the event at hand to be seeing something in the future, something on the horizon of his life and his mission. Specifically, in both instances, he has turned his face toward Jerusalem. He's facing the likelihood of rejection, 
of suffering and death as part of his mission. So Jesus uses the metaphor of the grain of wheat to illustrate or explain this reality. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. The words encapsulate the mission of Jesus and the pattern of true discipleship. In its dormant stage, a single grain of wheat seems pretty insignificant. It possesses a lot of potential. There's a lot of energy stored in that little grain. But nothing happens to it unless it is crushed to become flour or it falls into the earth and dies to become a new plant. When he draws on the image of the grain of wheat dying and being transformed into something greater, Jesus gives us a clue, a key to his future, to his future, and to ours and our growth in the life of Christian discipleship. To enter into a more authentic, deep future relationship with Christ, we always have to be breaking the shell, breaking the hull of our present existence, the constricting con circumference of our present life. The transformative power of the grain of wheat lies not in its self-preservation, but in its surrender. It has to fall to the earth and die or be crushed in order to achieve its purpose. And so this gives us a clue to the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross. It looks like defeat. It looks like failure. But it is the means to the end, which is redemption, where his mission is fulfilled and the fruits of salvation are gained for the whole world. As followers of Jesus, we are called, we are baptized to emulate that pattern of sacrificial love and self-spending. Jesus affirms this when he says, Whoever loves their life loses it, and whoever hates their life in this world preserves it to eternal life. It's a hard saying because it always sounds like we should hate our lives. It doesn't mean that we should despise the life that we have, but it does mean that we should prioritize eternal kingdom values over temporal values. It's a call to surrender our selfish desires and personal ambition in order to wholeheartedly embrace God's will for us. In a world that's marked by self-gratification and pursuit of personal gain, this kind of message of self-denial and sacrificial love is very countercultural and it's very counterintuitive. And yet it is precisely in this dying this self-spending, that we discover what Jesus was talking about in John 3.16 when he said that he came to bring the fullness of life. We find meaning and fulfillment when we lay down our lives for others in humble service or self-sacrifice. When we talk about this, or discipleship in general, we like to call to mind exemplars like Saints Teresa of Calcutta, Oscar Romero, Maximilian Kolbe, the big guns. And while their example is certainly, certainly important, and their service unskippable to the marginalized, the homeless, the suffering, those who are in the shadow of death, we also need to remember that self-sacrifice and self-denial and laying down our lives can take a lot of other forms as well. So for instance, leading a little air out of our overinflated egos can do tremendous things for the world at large. Curbing our desire to gossip or 
trash talk or make snide remarks about others, keeping love alive in the world is tremendous service to humankind and the kingdom of God. To pick up a few cues from the letter to the Hebrews today, self-sacrifice invites us to ceaseless, heartfelt prayer, to letting ourselves be brokenhearted by the suffering of others in the world. Because there is so much of it, sometimes we become kind of numb to it. But can we feel the heartbreak that others are going through? And then, not just feel it and pray about it, but do something about it as well. The letter to the Hebrews also talks about how Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. We can learn it through obedience to the suffering that God may ask us to embrace in our own lives. Suffering that we can't do anything about. Something that is day in, day out. Selfless discipleship can mean really listening to others. To use the oft-used expression of St. Benedict, to listen to others with the ear of our heart. Not just to hear the words that they're saying to us, but hear the things that sometimes aren't said. But it's there in the body language or the tone of voice or one's physical facial demeanor, listening with compassion, openness, not being judgmental or critical or defensive. We know that there is a lot of division today in the church, in our society, our political systems, in the world, sometimes even in our families. The prophet Jeremiah, writing what was our first reading today is talking about there were there was a lot of division in his time too when the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel and Judah were very much separated and yet Jeremiah prophesies a time when God would speak to the world as a unified whole he'd relate to them as an undivided community and so through various covenants God called the people back to fidelity, called them back to unity, called them back to love of one another and of God as well. And we know then that the definitive covenant was executed on Calvary and ratified by the sacrifice of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. This holy season and this coming holy week remind us that the journey of discipleship and imitation of Christ is not without cost or challenge or consequence. Always, always, like for Jesus, the cross looms on the horizon, waiting for us to accept it or not. The choice is ours. Yet Jesus assures us that if we accept the cross, final victory will be ours. So as we reflect upon his example, we recommit ourselves to self-sacrifice, to sacrificial love. And we pray that his example will inspire us, his spirit empower us, his love compel us to live lives worthy of the gospel. My sisters and brothers, with all the church, let us profess our faith and trust in God, 
in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. With trust and confidence in the providence of God our Father, let us turn to him and through Jesus ask him to hear our prayers and needs of this day. They continue to serve with wisdom, humility, and love. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the leaders of states and nations, may they always seek the good of all, especially those who are vulnerable and marginalized. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For peace in our hearts and peace in our world, May we find just resolutions to present conflicts, especially those in Ukraine, Gaza, Haiti, and Sudan. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our For those who are sick or suffering in body, mind, or spirit, may God heal those who call upon the Lord in faith, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those preparing for initiation and full communion at Holy Easter, and for those preparing for the sacraments of priesthood, diaconate, and marriage, may God sustain them on their journey and fill them with courage and love. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For vocations to our community, may gracious souls continue to serve God and the church through the monastic manner of life. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our oblates gathered in prayer and reflection today, May God bless them abundantly as they seek to follow the way of St. Benedict. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our Heavenly Father, hear these prayers and those which remain in the silence of our hearts. Go before us on our journey of faith, anticipate our needs, prevent our falling, and have mercy on us who are your children. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Sunday collection, both in church and online, will go for the support of Espera. And thank you for your generosity.
Pray, sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to Almighty God. Hear us, Almighty God, and having instilled in your servants the teachings of the Christian faith, graciously purify them by the working of this sacrifice, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your heart. We Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, 
always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, for through the saving passion of your Son, the whole world has received a heart to confess the infinite power of your majesty. Since by the wondrous power of the cross, your judgment on the world is now revealed, and the authority of Christ crucified. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks, as in exaltation we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and from the world's beginning are ceaselessly at work, so that the human race may become holy just as you yourself are holy. Look, we pray, upon your people's offerings and pour out on them the power of your Spirit, that they may become the body and blood of your beloved Son, Jesus the Christ, in whom we too are your sons and daughters. Indeed, though we once were lost and could not approach you, you loved us with the greatest love, for your Son, who alone is just, handed himself over to death and did not disdain to be nailed for our sake to the wood of the cross. But before his arms were outstretched between heaven and earth to become the lasting sign of your covenant, he desired to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. As he ate with them, he took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to them, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, knowing that he was about to reconcile all things in himself through his blood to be shed on the cross, he took the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine, and once more giving you thanks, handed the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Passover and our surest peace, we celebrate his death and resurrection from the dead, and looking forward to his blessed coming, we offer you, who are our faithful and merciful God, this sacrificial victim who reconciles to you the human race. Look kindly, most compassionate Father, on those you unite to yourself by the sacrifice of your Son, 
and grant that by the power of the Holy Spirit, as they partake in this one bread and one chalice, they may be gathered into one body in Christ, who heals every division. Be pleased to keep us always in communion of mind and heart, together with Francis our Pope and Patrick our Bishop. Help us to work together for the coming of your kingdom until the hour when we stand before you, saints among the saints in the halls of heaven. With the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints, and with our deceased brothers and sisters, whom we humbly commend to your mercy. Then, freed at last from the wound of corruption and made fully into a new creation, we shall sing to you with gladness the thanksgiving of Christ, who lives for all eternity. Through him, with him, in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to pray. Our Father, Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom of God, Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your Let us share a sign of peace.
Behold the Lamb of God, Jesus who takes away the sins of the world. Happy and blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter my life, but only say the word, and my soul shall be
Let us pray. We pray, Almighty God, that we may always be counted among the members of Christ, in whose body and blood we have communion, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth, the Mass is ended.